Good afternoon. Uh, this meeting come to order. It's uh, right here and uh, at one o'clock. Okay, and then probably it's uh, good to see everyone here. And I guess our mayor is down in Newfoundland right now, so I'm trying to take the job in, which is not going to be very good, not likely. But anyway, we'll try our best. That's all I can do. Anyway, yes. Okay. We'll proceed with the meeting now. It's been available on the internet. So uh, I ask the clerk to conduct the roll call, please. Deputy Mayor Windover, are you present? Here, yeah. Councillor Armstrong? Present. Councillor Franzen? Present. Councillor Lambshead? Present. First staff, Donna Taggart, CAO Treasurer? Present. Steve Brockbank, Director of Emergency Services? Present. Barbara Waldron, Director of Building and Planning? She's here. She just must be having some technical difficulties. Um, Adele Arbor, planner. Present. Ann Roof, deputy clerk. Present. And Jesse Clark, director of corporate services, clerk is present. Okay. We have a moment of reflection. Okay, I'd like to uh, take this opportunity to introduce two new staff that has just joined our wonderful municipality here. And that's Barbara Walder, uh, the Chief Billing Official, Director of Billing and Planning. For 21 years, Barbara has served as a well-respected Chief Billing Official and in rural Ontario. Barb is also a Board of Directors for the Ontario Building Official Association, where she actively promotes the vital role rural building staff play in protecting with residents of Ontario. Can we all wish her all the best? Come on, come Can't on. clap, eh? No. Okay. <laughs> uh, also, Evans, uh, it's it's Gregor. I hope I have it right. As a director of public works, Evan is previously employed by the Township of Cabin Monican as a project engineer, operator, supervisor, and we are pleased to have him join our public works team. Thank you all, thank you. Now, have the disclosure of preliminary interest? If not now, they can do it at any time during the meeting. So we get a motion for the approval of the agenda. Carol, Peter, thank you very much. Okay, all in favor? That motion is passed. Okay. Okay, okay it was adoption of the minutes then of the council meetings of special council meeting August the 4th. Terry, Peter. Okay. Sorry, through you, Deputy Mayor Wendover, you can do all the minutes with one motion. Oh, okay, we'll do all the minutes then. Do you want me to sign them off? Or, huh? I will make that same motion for all the minutes of the meeting. Okay, very good. Second that, Peter, you did? Yeah. Okay, all in favor? Yeah. Okay, approved, good. Very good. Okay, now we have a committee and board members. So, Economic Development Advisory Committee, August the 9th meeting. Motion to yes. 
Okay, motion to receive, second. Second for all of the committee meetings. All of them the committee meetings. Okay, good. Very good. Okay, now, so we will have. Sorry, Deputy Mayor Linda, but just call for the vote. Oh, yes, yes, yeah. vote, yes. Approved, yes, approved, yes. Yeah. Okay, statutory public meeting planning act. Oh. Yes. Through you, Deputy Mayor Wendover, on um, item 5.3, which is the liaison reports for council boards and committees. Oh, okay, yeah. Oh, it's an open, open, okay. Yeah, so the liaison report for council board and committee. Approving. Thank you, uh, Deputy yeah. Mayor. I do have something submitted by our uh, library CEO, yeah. uh, which I'd just like to read. Sure. So, uh, with the help of a grant from Pat Moore's Communities Matter, the library has improved the accessible collections. These collections help seniors and people with disabilities access books through the library. The grant was used to improve the large print collection in both branches, as well as the ebook and audiobook collections. Uh, and secondly, the summer reading program was a success. The library would like to thank Pizza Aloro and the Catch 507 for their uh, contributions toward that program. Any comments? So, motion to approve. That, no, we, we don't need don't, a motion for that. Don't no. need one? Okay. Economic development then? Advisory committee, August the 9th. Deputy Mayor Wendover, we're now on item 5.4, which is Bob Taylor Basie oh, for sorry, the PRCIC that. project funds. Oh, okay. But item 5.4. Oh, 5.4 then, okay. Bob Taylor and other part of recreation and culture advisory. Is Bob here to present? Bob will do a presentation. Yep. Okay. Yes. Can you hear me? Yep. I think so. Mm -hmm. Can you see me? Nope. Can't no. see you, I know. That may be a good thing. <laughs> there you are. See you now. Oh, there you go. There yeah. we go. Well, thank you, Deputy Mayor Windover, and uh, good afternoon, members of council and staff and, and uh, the virtual audience. And I want to thank Ann Ruth for uh, her keys, her hands on the keyboard, they make this flow. Uh, PRCAC achieved a pretty major milestone in June with the endorsement of a number of project plans. And this meeting uh, represents another milestone. Uh, next. Uh, today, um, we will review those project plans in detail uh, with you and ask for your continued support that we are not justifying their need, but how to convert a concept into a tangible result. Next. Now this presentation should move pretty quickly. Um, I think I timed it 18 minutes, but depends how slowly I speak. Um, as I summarize uh, how we got here, um, I want to acknowledge some ongoing support identify some specific requests for counsel in the form of a draft motion and then undertake a plan by plan uh, review next uh, three project plans have been developed um, for implementation uh, boat launches open spaces and cultural resource management and these project plans uh, detail the scope of work that is required identify actionable items and milestones and recommend uh, roles and responsibilities uh, in order to proceed. I do want to say that project plans, however structured, uh, uh, are often known to move a little bit. So what we're going to present for approval today is what we are projecting, but uh, as we saw with COVID-19, the best plans can change. Next. Uh, it's worth noting that there are four other initiatives. Um, in process is uh, input into a municipal volunteer management plan. 
as well as our input uh, into the Buckhorn sports pads, sports pad study, which is underway. And there are two pending initiatives. The first is input into a municipal partnership policy. And the second is the development of a community hub project plan, which we have deferred until quarter four of this year. Next. Um, I think it's really important to acknowledge the assistance that we've required or acquired even from the beginning. Um, in terms of staff, I mean, every member of staff has, has had input into this, but uh, Donna Taggart, uh, Dylan, Andrew, Jesse, and Hidal Arbor have been outstanding, and they provide both constructive and candid feedback at every phase. On council, I want to really acknowledge <clears throat> the contribution on my committee of councillors Lamhead and Franson, who not only support what we're doing 100%, but also give us very sage advice on, on what it is that council would expect to see. And I also want to acknowledge <clears throat> the work that Councillor Armstrong uh, has done uh, in the past and continues to as a member of the Trails Subcommittee. The members of the committee itself, Bill Kent, Sheila Perry, and Jessamyn Roach, those are outstanding without this team, we wouldn't be here. And also past members who made major contributions, Sheila Cook, Lance Cuthart, uh, Marlis Kirkman, and Bruce Averill. Next slide. Uh, this is a draft motion for council to consider, and I really appreciate the assistance of the clerk's office in drafting it for you. I'm going to read it in its entirety. Uh, that council received the presentation from Bob Pulevesi, Chair of Parks, Recreation, Culture Advisory Committee regarding project plans. And further, that council endorsed the boat launches project plan and direct the PRCAC to lead its implementation and to include it in their 22 work plan. And further, that council endorsed the open spaces project plan and direct staff to develop and issue an RFP to engage a consultant to undertake further work. And further, that council endorsed the cultural resources management heritage project plan and direct the PRCAC to lead its implementation and to include it in the revised 2021 and 22 work plan. Next. So the first project plan uh, deals with a, a boat launches. The boat launch in this photograph you recognize as that wonderful area uh, at the West Bay Road. Next. Uh, we're going to focus on existing municipal boat launches as well as uh, the ownership of other boat launches by the Crown, specifically MRF, uh, Parks Canada, or private ownership uh, to determine, determine municipal boundaries uh, for a, a situation, for example, where municipal property and Crown are private land abut, and we need to determine where the municipal boundaries begin and end. An example is the same West Bay Road. Development standards for uh, for boat launches in the municipality, and then also identify opportunities to defray costs through partnerships and sponsorships and other uh, philanthropic donations. Next slide. There are five key deliverables in this plan: a site-by-site -site review of all municipal boat launches, including such things as where they are, uh, how much parking exists, what opportunities are for land use improvements including different amenities like benches and washrooms, a development of, a st of standards for all of them. I want to mention that of the standards required, the one that is most commented on in our survey, the 2020 spring survey, and also in the fall, was invasive species. We're going to recommend uh, land use improvements where applicable for current municipal sites, for example, benches or interpretive signage. Also potential revisions to bylaw 2013-061 that relates to the use of municipal open space that were applicable. Boat launches is actually mentioned in that bylaw but only once. And finally to design a map that shows the location of all the municipal boat launches. Next. Uh, this is a work effort uh, to be assigned to PRCAC. We will all undertake all further research and continue to collaborate with staff. From a municipal staff perspective, uh, they would review all of our research and the options that we've identified, and then staff would present 
any recommend any recommended standards, uh, their timing and cost of their implementation to council. And finally, there are other support groups uh, possible. One is leverage from both Trent and Fleming uh, because of their research experience and opportunities for internship, as well as as a third party uh, partners that are well versed in, uh, in in the future of boat launches. Next. So the next step is uh, I want to make it clear that generally uh, resident feedback did not identify this as a high priority. So we are recommending that we defer further work on this plan until 2022 to allow uh, the PRCAC to concentrate on three higher priority areas, specifically community hall of future governance and hubs, cultural resource management, and the ongoing support of a consult consultant driven open spaces master plan. Next. The next uh, plan is uh, open spaces. And you can see uh, two highlighted here. The Mississauga River location is, as you know, uh, on the east side of uh, County Road 23, just north of Buckhorn, where the where the access park is, the access parking lot is to the park. Next. Now this project plan provides the background data and suggested deliverables for a consultant-led project to include a municipal-wide trails network, uh, connectivity between parkland beaches and cultural properties. Examples of cultural properties are cemeteries, historical plaques, and designated historical properties. And, uh, and finally, uh, education and community outreach on all of it. Next. There are four strategic themes that uh, were assigned to this initiative. They're all very common and standard, but equally important. And they are active living, connectivity, accessibility, and affordability. Next. Of the key deliverables, first and foremost, is the need for a request for proposal to engage a consultant to undertake the development of a long-term open spaces plan. One of the three appendixes to this plan lays out qualifications for a third party consultant, not to mention overall project expectations, which are include uh, one or all of the following. First of all, to investigate potential land acquisition, understanding that in the spring 2020 survey, resident feedback was they did not want the township, the municipality, to spend their money to acquire new land. They're okay with things happening on land that we owned, but not land that they wanted, that we had needed to acquire. Second, a site-by-site -site review of the current vacant land. There are about 43 different properties that are vacant, that are owned by the municipality, and each one of them could or could not be a hub on a connected set of trails. Next, uh, so a set of design standards. Not to mention a categorization of parks and trails. Categories of parks and trails, because there are different kinds of parks and there are different kinds of trails. This is a very traditional approach that is uh, is is normal uh, when you canvas other municipal plans. And <clears throat> potential by revisions to the bylaw again, because open space is uh, um, a is included in that bylaw, but trails specifically is not. Uh, next, the impact of, of anything we need to do on, on future staff capacity and, and options for, for staffing. This kind of bolsters um, Dylan's expectations of a, a new facility on, on the County Road 49 and what this would suggest that he, may, he might need uh, to, uh, to staff up there. Next. Uh, we need to, to update our risk assessment. It's really important that we understand all the risks that are associated with this plan, all the controls we need to put in place, and who's going to own those controls. And they're, they're, they include, but they are not limited to three, occupational health and safety, accessibility, and insurance liability. Next. Uh, there was a 2021 short-term proposal that was inadvertently omitted from a draft of this presentation, and it's this one, and that is the production in 2021 
of a brochure promoting the existing trails in the municipality. And I might mention that at the beginning, I think that was focusing on on uh, the trails uh, just off County Road 23, uh, a small trail up at Dapton Park, and then the Chase property. But really, it has to include uh, the trail properties on on uh, oh, Philbert Drive, over at at the ranch, over by Burley Falls, and a number of trails that that exist uh, in the Crystal Lake area. Next. There are two kinds of resources that we're bringing to bear in this. The first is documentary. There are three appendixes that are attached to this plan. One, as I said, is considerations for developing a, an RFP. And there are two more. They are both detailed background uh, appendixes, one specifically on trails and the second one on parkland, playgrounds and beaches. We included both of these separately because as you remember, initially we had uh, separated any pr any plans on trails from any plans on parkland, playgrounds, and beaches until we combine them in June of this year. Next. The second set of resources follows a more standard structure, so the lead will be the third-party consultant to design uh, an open spaces network um, based on the scope of work identified in the RFP. Uh, municipal staff has a very dedicated role. Uh, they are responsible for the management of that contract including any procurement procedures and overall project management. And they would also be the sponsor of the plan to council for approval to proceed with whatever recommendations um, the third party consultant um, makes. Next, uh, there are some other supporting resources. One is the Open Spaces Subcommittee. Currently that uh, is called the Trails Subcommittee. We need to rename it and we need to revise its terms of reference. It would provide, as it has already, a lot of necessary information through its own extensive research uh, to support the work as a consultant and would also be a major stakeholder uh, to review the proposed plan as it develops. And finally, there are third party partnerships and sponsorships that might provide some or would provide some potential sources for financial backing. And we would expect some idea of that to be an outcome of that consultant report. Next. So our immediate next step is to develop an RFP for review by the PRCAC Open Spaces Subcommittee and Council and production in 2021 of a promotional brochure highlighting existing trails. Next. The final plan for review is cultural resources management. And you see two examples of different kinds of heritage, one being the Deer Bay Schoolhouse and the other being uh, Nogi Creek Cemetery. Next, of the three project plans, the components of this plan are the most highly regulated by provincial statute and industry best practices. Mm -hmm. As with boat launches, this plan lays out the foundation for a project to be led by PRCAC. We really focus on two things. One is built heritage, uh, which is crudely would be called buildings and structures. Cultural landscapes, which is really land that has been adjusted and changed by man. And a classic example of a cultural landscape is a cemetery. And then documentary and material heritage, which more commonly is probably called archival records and archival resources. And the second focus, of course, will be a fairly considerable and extensive education and community outreach on a topic which tends to be very either not understood or misunderstood. Next, there are four strategic themes we attach to this one. Um, I don't, I typically read my slides, but I think I, I'm going to read a lot of this one because it's important. Uh, Trent Lakes has a, a pretty unique cultural identity. If you read the book on Harvey, it comes off the page. There's some very unique things here. We want to celebrate that and we want to provide access to that heritage to others. That includes preserving and, and developing uh, places and, and, and spaces and to encourage investment in our culture and to encourage investment to help us uh, create a real sense of cultural leadership. And if you look at the cultural plan for the city of Kawartha Lakes, there's a very clear focus on 
cultural leadership in the municipality. And finally, and the more standard phrase, to preserve, to protect, and to enhance our heritage. Next. There are a number of key milestone activities, and I, uh, I want to, I'd like you to understand that to a large extent, they look daunting, and they are all, almost all, interrelated, and they are all achievable. First is a survey dealing specifically with cultural heritage uh, needs and aspirations. Um, the spring 2020 survey did not address this in an adequate way. There was a reason for that, and the reason, good or bad, was that the survey was getting so long that to add another seven or eight questions dealing with this topic would have made it unwieldy and probably would have reduced our response rate considerably. Uh, we would undertake that survey in the latter part of this year. We need to make sure that we understand all the complexities of both statutory and regulatory requirements. Um, specifically with reference to cultural resources. We need to inventory all the archival documentation that exists in the township. I want to make it, uh, this is my own personal background, of course, but it is not possible to develop any archival program, nor to identify the need for any archival repository without knowing what exists. And it's not what exists in theory, but it's what exists in fact. So this inventory, uh, which I, I can assure you is very straightforward. It takes some time, but it is essential if we're going to control that aspect of our cultural heritage. Next, we will need in addition the following, we'll need a, an approved cultural resources policy or bylaw for the, for the municipality. And this needs to include guidelines for honorific and commemorative naming beyond benches and tree planting. That's the focus of the current policy. But you're going to have an example later into the agenda from uh, Gary Giroux, from Cray, um, of how uh, th there is a need to expand that policy uh, uh, with honorific and commemorative naming. We need a, to uh, have an approved terms of reference for a municipal heritage committee. I will tell you that the template for that committee is well established by in the Ontario Heritage Trust uh, Heritage Toolkit. We need an approved heritage bylaw, similar to the one we have at, uh, in the city of Kortha Lakes and also uh, 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 the township of Scugog. Uh, we need to uh, identify an approved dedicated space to put records, whether, whether it's in a community hall, whether it's in the library, which is my preference, or in the, in the, in, in the case of neither, into the care and custody of a third party repository such as the Trent Valley Archives. Next, we need to undertake an inventory and architectural analysis of all potential heritage properties. Um, this is a project that could be well undertaken by a team of students from Trent under a program perfectly suited to this work. We need a set of best practices as you can, can read here. The interesting one is what you read here is interpretation programming through digital delivery. The example of that is when you when you when you drive down the road and you see a heritage plaque, and on that plaque you may see uh, a link. Uh, so on your phone you have an app, you scan the link, you listen on your phone, and bingo, you get like an oral history of the plaque. So you just don't read the plaque and say that's nice. You actually get a history be what lies behind the plaque. Uh, so we need to to investigate that kind of best practice. It is. Uh, in a beta project that you probably are aware in the city of Peterborough as we speak, and also through the Ontario Heritage Trust. And we need a heritage register of not only designated properties, once they are, um, but also properties that are, have not yet been designated, should be, uh, and are in the process of being designated. Next, the resources for this, the lead would be PRCAC uh, through its Heritage Advisory Subcommittee, and then subsequently, the Municipal Heritage Committee, which is a requirement of the Heritage Act. We would look for the normal, I don't mean to be to, to be uh, uh, fawning, but outstanding support of staff, uh, basically through two different groups, uh, planning and development, uh, which we have the immense uh, uh, 
uh, background and expertise of Adele Arbor and uh, recreation facilities because at the end of the day, uh, their colleague Dylan Koch is the one that takes over the care and custody of all these plants. Next, uh, there are uh, additional resources we will bring to bear for this. One is, uh, again, Trent University and Sir Sanford Fleming with some of their outreach programs and the Ontario Heritage Trust and the National Trust for Canada, which are two of the leading heritage uh, associations in the country. Uh, there are a number of related associations of which I've listed three. Uh, one is the Greater Harvey Historical Society, which has been working over the last you know, couple of decades to, to accumulate uh, uh, and, and publish and promote heritage. The Peterborough Historical Society that brings with it an immense uh, experience in heritage preservation. And groups like the Buckhorn Turst Association, because at the end of the day, one of the expectations of a cultural plan is, is to incorporate into it the sense of cultural tourism at, at the right balance. We don't want to attract a whole bunch of people in the township just to get them here, because I'm sure a number of cottagers and seasonal residents would not be pleased with a whole bunch of increased traffic. And we do, certainly don't want to, to replicate what happened uh, I'll just hop County Road 23 when for a period of time we had cars on both sides of the road and people going between cars and crossing the street on a very busy road to get to uh, the river. And finally, uh, other interest groups of which the primary one uh, is First Nations, that would in our case be Curve Lake, not to mention the uh, City of Kawartha Lakes uh, Truth and Recreation, Recreate, Recre Truth and Reconciliation uh, uh, committees, uh, advisory committee. Next. So the next steps uh, here immediately would be to count for council to, to approve for our PRCAC to implement the methodology uh, we've provided focusing on uh, some immediate 2021 deliverables. Next. Uh, the last slide is just a reminder slide on the, on the motion. What I, I do want to to make clear before I, I hand this over to the deputy mayor, is that approval of this or a similar motion uh, will allow us, being PRCAC, to revise both our 2021 work plan, which we would be uh, uh, doing on Thursday at our Thursday meeting, and also begin to draft our 2022 work plan, uh, uh, both, both, both for your approval and quarterly review. So that's the end of my presentation. Um, if, if there are any questions or comments, I'd be more than willing to see if I can answer them for you. Well, thank you very much. That was a great presentation. I don't, any questions or comments from the councillors? Carol? Uh, thank you, and for you, Deputy Mayor. Uh, thanks, Bob. Excellent presentation, as always. Um, I am pleased to see that the committee is narrowing its focus to uh, you know, a select vital few initiatives. I think that will um, mean that they can actually be brought to fruition during this term, which is uh, going to be important. Uh, the two questions, uh, one, and it's because I can't remember, but for those who may not know, uh, can you share with us how many boat launches we already have? It's quite substantial. I was not aware of this. And I'm thinking it's 12 to 16 boat launches that we that the municipality owns and manages, something like that? The list of boat launches on Dillon's comprehensive list is 23, of which 13 are municipal and the rest are either private, um, Crown, or Parks Canada. So it's 13. Terrific. But as you know, Councillor, I'm, as you know, Councillor Armstrong, the, the boat launches, uh, a lot of them are, if not anything else, very remote. Right. But I think many of us who've never taken advantage of them didn't even know that we actually provided that level of resource. So, so thanks for sharing that. Um, the second question, uh, and I don't know that there's an answer today, but the one thing missing from each of the project plans was financial implications. Uh, we'll be entering into our budget cycle all too soon, although Donna probably has already started. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and it would be helpful to know whether any of these initiatives will require budget monies, and if so, roughly how much. 
I mean, certainly the one that, that stands out to me is the consultant for an open spaces strategy, which um, having been a member of that subcommittee is absolutely essential for us to, to take the next step. But it will involve money for a consultant, you know, 25, 30, some thousand dollars, don't know how much, but we'll need to have that scope for the budget for next year. Uh, the other thing was the production of a brochure, which is this year. So I'm assuming that that can be covered with the monies already allocated to the committee. Um, so again, not looking for a, a number necessarily today, but clearly within the next, uh, I would say four to six weeks, we'll need some kind of an indication of what the financial implications are for implementing uh, uh, pieces of those three project plans for next year. And if the community hub uh, strategy comes forward, that may also uh, have implications for our budget for next year. I think it's a really good question. I'm sorry, through you, Deputy Mayor, to, to, to Councillor Armstrong. I think that's a good question. I, um, I think that it that uh, there's a, there's a development that that uh, has taken place in the municipality through the uh, initiative of uh, clerk's office, and that is to ensure that uh, committee work plans are integrated with budget planning. So budget plans and work plans are hand in glove. And so the process is that that we would uh, and and at our meeting on on Thursday um, we will be looking at uh, the beginnings of our 2022 work plan uh, and and attempting to associate with that work plan at, at the best rough cut numbers. We then uh, will present will work with staff to um, to uh, and particularly with Dylan to make sure that those numbers are in the budget that goes to you for review and approval. So the answer, do I have the numbers now? No. Um, in the case of open spaces, um, I don't know how we would establish um, a, a cost. I don't know uh, how we would know how much a consultant is going to cost until we develop the RFP and the consultant comes back with what they're going to charge. Um, so in that case, I, I think we're kind of our hands are tied. The other two, um, I, I don't see significant uh, uh, costs for um, either of them. But uh, you, no, your your point's well taken. It was, it, we can't perceive without knowing what the budgetary impact is. And as soon as we know what that is, as soon as we know what that is, and get that into the hands of staff, then it'll get into the budget process. Is, is that okay? No, that's great, Bob. I, as I say, I didn't, I wasn't trying to pin you down on a number now, but just raise that that aspect. Um, and I think in terms of the open trails or open space consultant, we can look to other communities to see what their studies look like and roughly what costs were involved, so we can, you know, get a, a ballpark number as to what the consultant study might be. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions, comments? I would just like to make a comment through you, Deputy sure. Mayor, that, that there's been an enormous amount of effort been put into this by all the members of this committee. And I think it's, we've come up with a very good plan to move forward. I, I think this has been a daunting task during COVID time. And I, I really do appreciate all the effort that's been put into this. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, Propose a motion to receive. <clears throat> oh, sorry. I, I I would support the motion. Oh, okay, sure. If you there's make appropriate motion. time to do it. Hmm. Who's making the motion? You make the motion. Dan? I'll make the motion. Okay. Second it. Terry. I will okay. second the motion as long as the motion is what is on the screen. The screen here. Yeah, the council received right? the presentation from Bob Taylor yeah. Basie, Chair of yeah. Parks, Recreation and Culture Advisory Committee regarding project plans and further the council endorsed the boat launch project plan and direct the PRCAC to lead this implementation in, and to include it in their 2022 work plan and further the council endorsed the open space project plan and direct staff to develop and issue an RFP which is a request for a proposal to engage a consultant to undertake further work and further the council endorse the cultural resources management heritage project plan and direct the PRCAC to lead its implementation and to include it in their revised 2021 and 2022 work plans. Okay. 
in favor? The, I'm sorry. Discussion? Uh, thank you, Deputy Mayor. Um, can I suggest, now that I read it, a slight amendment? Because the second one is directing staff to develop an issue in RFP. I'm wondering if we can add just a little clause at the end that says subject to budget approval for all of them. Would that be acceptable, yeah, motion. Chief Peter? No, I have no problem with that. And as a seconder to you, Deputy Mayor, I have no issues with that either. Okay. okay thank you. All in favor? Okay, approved. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Goodbye. Goodbye, there. Yeah. So, uh, statutory public meeting going to the Planning Act. Good afternoon. Are you able to hear me? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Sorry. Sorry, down through you, Deputy Mayor. We'll just need a motion to suspend the regular meeting. Oh, okay. Sorry. A motion to suspend the regular meeting. Carol, Terry, okay. All favor? Okay, approved, yes. Sorry. Okay, Dale. Thank you. Through you, Deputy Mayor Windover, today's first public meeting is being held under Section 22 and 34 of the Planning Act to consider an official plan amendment and zoning bylaw amendment with the remaining second and third public meetings being held under section 34 of the planning act to consider an amendment to the municipality zoning bylaw b 2014-070 a notice of public meeting for today's applications containing the prescribed information was circulated to all landowners within a 120 meter radius of the subject lands at least 20 days prior to this meeting the notice was also mailed to all prescribed agencies, public bodies, and persons in accordance with the regulations. Anyone wanting to be notified of any decision from today's public meeting must send in a written request to myself or the clerk, and the notice of passing will be mailed to them, setting out the method and manner in which appeals may be made to the Ontario Land Tribunal. Please note if a person does not send a written comment prior to the passing of the bylaw or make an oral submission at today's public meeting, that person may not be entitled to appeal this decision. Our first public meeting for consideration is an official plan amendment number 53 and zoning bylaw file number 20-28 submitted by agent Diana Key of DM Wells Associates on behalf of property owners Linda Ng Gilbert and Fabian Gilbert for the property located at 92 Peninsula Drive. The subject lands have a shoreline frontage of approximately 30 meters or 100 feet and a lot area of approximately 0.32 acres. The property was originally occupied with a dwelling that had a ground floor area of 908 square feet and a water yard setback of 10 meters or 33 feet. In September 2018, Council approved zoning bylaw amendment which resulted in the construction of a replacement dwelling with a ground floor area of 1,600 square feet. The 2018 zoning bylaw amendment approved by Council approved the water, set, water yard setback at 10.4 meters or 34 feet which was a one foot improvement to the water yard setback of the original dwelling. In 2019, it was discovered that the replacement dwelling had been constructed with a water yard setback of 7.92 meters or 26 feet, and therefore was not compliant with the 2018 zoning bylaw amendment. The replacement dwelling was constructed 2.5 meters or 8.2 feet closer to the high water mark then permitted by the zoning bylaw. A mitigation plan was submitted in support of the applications and has been peer reviewed by Stantec. There is a planning report on the agenda from the municipality's planning consultant, Chris Jones. His report states that the applications are generally consistent with provincial policy. However, he notes that the construction of the replacement dwelling does not conform with the official plan or zoning bylaw and he does not support the amendments. 
Agent Diana Key and owner Linda in Gilbert is available on the line to answer any questions should council or the public have any. Further, if any members of the public do not register with the clerk indicating their intent to make an oral submission, but would like to at this time, please use the raise a hand feature so we are able to promote you in order for you to make an oral submission. And that concludes the presentation on the amendments. Thank you, Randall. Any questions? Any comments here? No. It's later. Yeah, yeah. Any yeah. members of the public? Comments? Oh, there, okay. Hi, can you hear me okay, Deputy Mayor? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Yeah, um, thank you for the opportunity to speak this afternoon. Uh, my name is Emma Drake and I work with Diana Kay at DM Wills. Uh, unfortunately, Diana was unable to make the meeting this afternoon, um, but I'd like to provide a couple of comments uh, for your consideration with respect to this application. Um, as noted by Adele, the official plan and zoning bylaw amendment applications before you today are driven largely by the need to recognize a reduced water yard setback of 7.9 meters for uh, this dwelling, which was constructed in honest error with the reduced water yard setback. The property did receive a previous zoning bylaw amendment, which permitted the water yard setback to be 10.4 meters. However, uh, through inadvertence in the construction process, the dwelling was unfortunately constructed uh, with these reduced setbacks. Uh, there is also a bunkie on the property, uh, which was relocated during the construction, which maintains uh, deficient setbacks. So the OPA and the ZBA before you today seek to recognize the 7.9 meter setback from the high water mark to the dwelling, recognize a 3.7 meter side yard setback for the dwelling, recognize a 13.6 meter setback from the high water mark to the bunkie, and recognize a 1.5 meter side yard setback for the bunkie. Uh, while we do recognize uh, that it's generally not the intent of applicable planning policies to further reduce the water yard setbacks, we believe that there is some opportunity under the applicable planning policies to recognize this when it will prevent undue hardship on the property owners and provided additional measures are taken to protect the water and the landscape. So the provincial policy statement and the growth plan do permit recreational and residential development in rural areas, provided that it is located outside of hazard lands and there's no impact on natural heritage features. Uh, similarly, the county official plan does direct that a 30 meter uh, vegetative buffer from the shoreline is to be established for all new development and that the preservation of natural shorelines are encouraged. Uh, this property, as with uh, neighboring properties along Peninsula Drive, has a reduced depth, so that 30 meter setback is not feasible. However, as Adele mentioned, uh, to accompany these applications, a mitigation plan was prepared by Cambium Inc. Uh, this plan provides measures to aid in ensuring that there will be no impacts on the features and would actually improve the naturalization at the shoreline through increased vegetative plantings. Uh, this plan was peer reviewed by Stantec. Uh, based on the professional opinions that were advanced through the mitigation plan work, implementation of the measures, uh, which can be completed through requisite agreements with the township, um, the environmental impact can be minimized. Uh, with respect to the bunkie specifically, uh, we would note that while the water yard is still reduced, uh, the bunkie itself is actually located further from the water than what was previously existing. Um, and so the bunkie is an improvement to uh, previous conditions. With respect to the municipality's official plan, uh, given that the reconstructed dwelling uh, though inadvertently encroaches further towards the water, uh, that's the trigger for the official plan amendment. And section 8.10.3 of the municipality's official plan provides direction for evaluating official plan amendments. And these criteria include the need for the proposed use, the suitability of the site, the compatibility of the proposed use and impacts on natural resources. Uh, so we did provide a planning letter uh, submitted with these applications and uh, as stated in that letter, the use of the subject property for a recreational dwelling is already established. The new recreational dwelling will enhance the functionality of the property um, and though the further encroachment was an unfortunate error um, and not in 
deliberate disregard to policy. Uh, the OPA would prevent undue hardship to these property owners who would otherwise need to reverse the construction that has already occurred on the property, um, which would require redisturbing um, soils and may have a greater impact. Uh, in addition, this property will maintain uh, setbacks similar to that of surrounding properties, and the reduced water and side yard setbacks can be mitigated uh, by the additional vegetative plantings, uh, which were uh, noted to be suggested by Cambium. At this time, uh, we would therefore ask that Council approve the OPA and ZBA applications with the understanding that the reduced setbacks were not intentional and were inadvertent. Uh, as I've mentioned, these applications will prevent undue hardship on the property owners and will prevent additional impact from having to reverse the construction uh, that has already occurred. The property owners are willing to take steps uh, to ensure that the reduced setbacks do not impact the features or the landscape. Uh, we would respectfully ask that staff be directed to prepare the required bylaws and amendments uh, for approval of these applications. Uh, I'll end my comments there, um, but myself and the property owners are online and available if there are any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Emma. If I could um, add to that before a decision is made, can I, can I, I just didn't want to interrupt, so can I segue in? But uh, thank you, Deputy Mayor, Councillor Armstrong, Councillor Francis, and, and Councillor Lambshead. Thank you, Emma Drake, for your time and your consideration of this. I'm just, my this is going to be very brief not 18 minutes that we had originally occurred but to add i'm just going to say this i'm not the whole application process and all of that uh, this is my perspective of it yes we got a permit september 2018 we have been the landowners since 1999. that, that cottage is in our family like this is this whole process has been very um stressful for us so sorry i didn't want to get emotional but we have owned the, the cottage since 1999 yeah we got a permit in september 2018. we hired buckhorn to excavate and construct the dwelling and we gave him the the permit or application with all the measurements and and we hired him to do it. And I, from our perspective, I just wrote checks. And I would like to add that Fabian Gilbert, my husband, was managing the whole process. He's not here today because he's sick, like Murphy's Law. But <laughs> so um, we gave Jack, Jeff from Buckhorn here. There you go. And he was in communication with the, the municipal inspector. I, I guess they know them. So he would. From our understanding, the inspector would go out and measure, right? You would think that he would measure to ensure that we are complying within that setback of, of whatever was required. So they pour the foundation, they finish it. From November 2018 to March 2019, just the foundation is there. So you could, so we didn't think to go and measure because Jeff had said, it's all good and you're past and you can now frame the structure. So great. And during that time, um, Fabe, we were Fabian's mom was got diagnosed with cancer, and then she had passed away in March of that year. So he was, uh, but the the project was closed from November to March. And as the inspect the municipality inspector gave us the permit to go ahead approved, and we went ahead and framed and plumbing and yada 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 and all this stuff. And then we get to June. And we're going to get our per so the 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 structure is finished, like two stories and all this stuff, and it's done. Fabian goes to get a new survey, and then it's the in June of 2019, and he drops it off at the municipality office in August, and then they tell the municipality office, Brian Raymond actually, the chief building tells him, oh, we think that judging by the survey, you're actually eight feet over what you're, the setback. And that, that is the first we heard of it. Okay, that's, so when, when Chris Jones submitted that memo dated August 30th, that I believe you have a copy of, it was, we only found out 
on that day. And then they issue a letter to us that states this. The only remedy is to apply for zoning bylaw and official plan amendment, which will probably not be passed, but you have no other recourse. Once you receive the denial, you will then have the opportunity to appeal your decision. That just sounds like bureaucratic red tape. And during this time, we've had to pay for a permit extension because our permit's still open. So we've had to pay for a permit extension because our permits, it's just like this catch 22 of like money that I've like pumped into the municipality. Okay, so, but the important thing, so it was not intentional on our part. And then noteworthy in Chris Jones's memo is that he's saying the responsibility is entirely the, the contractor and um, not, they admonish themselves of any responsibility, which I think is, is this cannot be the first time this has happened. If they issue us the permit, we pay fees. Well, why couldn't the inspector, if they're passing up to the next stage, ensure that that measurement is correct? Okay, so yes, I'll take responsibility. But at this stage, we are like, and so it's done, right? Now, Why did the municipality not ensure compliance themselves of, of the proper measurement? But it's it's finished. Okay, fine. So the building's already um, constructed, and we it's I, I can actually share a screen with you and show you the the structure. Um, but why did they not give up? Why did they not tell us this before? They had like ample time from October to there was like an eight month where the foundation was there, we could have actually dug it back and moved it at that point, but why would they give us approval and, and then and we're finished and then they tell us, oh, hey, by the way, um, so um, there, the can't, we have done everything. To, we got the report stating, the environmental report stating that um, we're not disturbing any natural, that it's, it's causing no or minimal harm to the water line or the environment. And to add to that, we did build in the buffer and we're very cognizant of that. And we're actually, we, we, we're gonna build an armor stone um, shoreline so that it will like, so that will add another like three feet to, would that, that's not a good idea? Well, I, <laughs> sorry, Councillor Arthur, I just, I heard that one of our other neighbors across the way did an armor stone um, <clears throat> shoreline, and he he we were just talking about that. So, from from our perspective, the there are no there none of our neighbors were like, oh, what did you do that for? And it's like nobody has an issue with it. The only person that has an issue with it is, from my viewpoint, is Chris Jones. And that's sorry, that's it. My Thank you. I'm sorry if I got a little heated or emotional, but that's my perspective on it. Yes, Councillor. Through, through you, Deputy Mayor. Yes, Wendover. I'm just concerned that you didn't get a survey for a building that's built in the water yard, thirty less than thirty meters from the the water yard water, and I think that's normally a requirement to to build in the water yard. We did have a survey. We had a survey before. We had the survey. Then they demolished the the original structure, and then we got a new survey when the new structure was erected. Sorry, I, I should clarify that. Normally, you plot the new building on the property with the use of a survey when it's in the thirty meter setback. I just under, don't understand why that didn't happen. Well, we got the appropriate surveys when they were, like we had a survey before with the original structure, and then we got the survey after when it was when it was completed. Yeah. Um, I didn't realize or nobody, we basically gave the contractor the keys and he was in communication with the municipal inspector. He didn't say you have to get another survey, but, and, and as far as my understanding was, the survey was only required when it was completed. 
you would think that um, when the foundation was poured, they the municipality could have why why don't they don't they don't adhere go out and go yeah well you're too does this happen all the time or could this be like a, a learning experience that why don't the inspectors measure to ensure that we're in compliance with that that's just not a thing i don't know if our Planner might want to answer that, or I, I think that oh. is, is a requirement. Having it surveyed, I think it's a requirement before you build a new structure in the water yard is to have the building surveyed and plotted on your property prior to starting construction of your new building. Through you, Deputy Mayor, that is correct. And my understanding is, I actually wrote the report uh, back in 2018. For the zoning bylaw amendment and there was a survey provided that showed where that um, replacement dwelling should be going and so our inspectors are not surveyors so that would have been plotted on the survey and then as they went ahead with their inspections is my understanding that it appeared closer than what the survey showed and that was the requirement by the chief building official at the time to request an additional survey to survey out the water yard setback. Okay, I was not, I did not realize, I nobody told me that we needed to survey after the construction of it or it would have been ordered. Um, we gave the keys to the contractor. He was in regular communication. So I'm sorry, was that Adele that was speaking, the planner? Um, I, I was not aware that we needed to get a survey at that point, or I would have ordered one. Believe me, I've um, analyzed this 30 ways to Sunday since. The, so had I known, I would have got, I would have, I would have, yes, I would have got a survey. So I didn't, I thought we got one when we did it. And I would, it, it's not like, I'm like, hey, yes, why don't you build it? So it, like, it's not like I, it, I gave the keys trusting that the process was the process. So I don't realize, I'm not there to check people's work. And I didn't realize that that's not the process that um, the municipality, yes, okay. The municipal inspector is not a surveyor, but I would, I, I assume that he would measure it if it's, and then why did you pass us through to the next step if it's not okay definitely mayor i'm sorry i i it's just my ignorance then i just don't but uh, for me i i think why would you give us the fear why would you let us frame and and plumb and do all this other stuff and it's like fully finished if we're the, like i i just i i don't know i i don't know why they would issue the next the approval and let us go on to the next phase if we're not but i just don't that i don't understand and but it's done now right i i'm can't i i it was beyond anything i didn't i obviously would not have wanted this to occur um there's no disturbance to the environment with it being where it is there is and there are no none of the neighbors have um an issue with it the only issue i see is revisioning from chris jones or the municipality and the reason is that it sets a precedent is that the reason that was in the memo if i'm reading correctly yes counselor i, th I think our deputy mayor has needs to take control of this okay so for you, Deputy Mayor, I, I'm just wondering, I know it's as of right to, for you to build a three meter deck on the front of that cottage. Are you intending on building a deck in the front of that cottage? No. Okay. No, no, there's no deck. It's, no, it's, it's done. So that's, that's my kind of question here is if, if you will relinquish that right to have a three meter deck on the front of that, yeah. that makes me feel a little better mm -hmm. about 
leaving the building eight feet closer to the water than it's supposed to be. But yeah, I would I will want not building it back. I no, would want assurances that there is no deck ever going on the front of that cottage because that honestly is your right. I'm, I'm talking, no, no, I'm not going to build a three meter deck on the front. We're done. <laughs> We're not building anything to the front. I can assure you of that. Like, well, no, there's no. One further comment is I do I do like the idea that you're going to improve the vegetative shoreline. So yeah. that that is something that I can trade off in my mind for the eight feet of error. I mean, we all realize people make mistakes. It's happened before. It's not the new first thing that's ever happened, I'm sure. But I, I have difficulty supporting this without some give back. So I'm happy to, and I, I want to add this. I'm very like, there's no compost program up in um, the courses and I compost everything and bring it all back and like, I'm, so I'm very conscious of the environment and I'm very aware of like, I will like, um, so I thought my neighbor told me that building at an armor stone shoreline, Councillor Armstrong, is not, that's not a good idea. I thought that it would, because it's rock and not, the, anyway, that's what my neighbor told me. And then that would add three feet. That's what they were saying. Through you, Deputy Mayor Rindo, I yeah. think that's all needs to be permitted by other agencies that yeah. they're not Trent Lakes. And I don't yeah. think you'll find any luck getting a permit to expand <laughs> your shoreline into the water yard. Okay. But that's, I mean, that's not our issue. Our issue is an eight foot error in locating the building on your property. Okay. I don't, I don't know if anyone has any more questions. Yeah, I, I, I <laughs> just a comment. I, I do like it that you're going to be uh, mitigating your shoreline. I think that somewhat uh, softens the blow of coming eight feet uh, closer. So you got to. Through you, Deputy Mayor Wendover, we do have one attendee, Gary Jarose, who has his hand up. Gary, if you'd like to speak to this application, um, we will unmute you so you can speak now. Thank you, Adele, or uh, Jesse. It's Gary Jarose, President of Cavendish Community Ratepayers Association. Um, I'm not here to uh, help council make a decision on whether to approve the zoning bylaw or not. Uh, but what I can do is provide some feedback relative to the shoreline naturalization. Um, so when I hear the applicant saying, you know, us being closer doesn't really affect the, uh, the naturalization of the shoreline or the lake or water quality, that is not entirely correct. We know, because we ran the Love Your Lake program and we know that the riparian section is very critical to the health and safety of the lake. And so, uh, you know, to reinforce Councillor Lamp's head, uh, armor stone is probably one of the worst things you could probably do at the shoreline. So um, regardless of which way council decides to make a decision, what I might suggest that uh, you consider is that if you were going to allow the, uh, this to go ahead, that the owner of the property be required to engage the land between to do an entire shoreline naturalization design and to undertake it and to implement it as per the land between because they are specialists they're the people we have used to naturalize shorelines uh, that they not be allowed to put any further additions to the house that would encroach upon the water yard to the high water mark and that they not put armor stone but if they do anything it be riparian or a uh, riprap or whatever specified by the uh, the land between. And uh, what you we could do is actually, because we're trying to do more of this in Trent Lakes, is if this was to be undertaken, this could be a model or display for naturalized shorelines, how to repair shorelines to uh, better naturalization. And that's all the comments that I have, thank you. Well, thank you, Gary, for, for your comments, yes. Uh, is there any other comments at all in regards to this? Yes. Yep, thank you, Jeffy. Um, yeah, I, Linda, I just wanted to add, well, I, I support Gary's comments about Armour Stone, and that's why you saw me grimace when you said that. So apologies, he made my grimace um, verbal. <laughs> um, I have to say, I do not understand all of the building processes either. So, you know, this is something that 
a, you know, a lay person does once or twice, but they're not an expert on it. On the other hand, um, it is the responsibility of the owner and the contractor to adhere to uh, whatever specifications have been put forward in a bylaw amendment. It may have been an honest mistake, and I'm quite prepared to accept that it was, but I could say that, uh, anybody could say that, and yes, I am concerned about setting a precedent because I can't determine if it was honest or not, and I don't want to go there because it challenges somebody's um, truthfulness, and that's not my job, and I have no interest in doing that. So I, would, I, I accept that it was an honest mistake, but I am very concerned that anybody else can get an assessment or an amendment to have a certain shoreline setback and then decide that it doesn't give them an appropriate view or it doesn't do something else, and they build inside of that setback and then come back and ask for another amendment. And that gives me heartburn because I don't think we're in the business of piling exception on exception on exception when there was a valid reason for that 30 meter shoreline setback in the first place. So I'm taking a little harder line on it. I apologize. Um, but again, you know, I, I think it's the owners and the contractors responsibility to ensure that they adhere to the specs that have been set out and not the monitoring agency who's the municipality, um, just from a perspective and, and you know, a common sense perspective. Well, thank you, Carol. I, myself, I can't understand how the building inspector would approve this. He wouldn't see that it was too close to the to the lake. I can't. But I do imagine they're supposed to be responsible to measure it, are they not? No. Nope. For sure. I can't understand how that happened. But uh, sure. there's certainly a mistake made there, I think, sure. believe, by the municipality some way. Through you, That's Deputy Mayor. I, I, I understand there's a mistake been made. We don't know where the mistake got made. We don't know the intent or non-intent of this mistake. But we're here to try to find a way forward. Yes. And for me, would you be, I would like to ask uh, Linda Ng there, that would, would you consider getting the land between to help design the front edge of your property to make it better for the environment? Yes, absolutely. I actually very much appreciate Gary DeRose taking the time and, and coming on and suggesting that. I had no idea. It was just our neighbor came up to us and said, so absolutely. I can assure you that I would I would go to my neighbor next door and and if he had a money issue, I would pay for it. I very much I want to ensure that our the 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 nature and the, the environment is protected. And that cottage is even when I'm no longer here, that it will be like the, so I want to ensure that that, it, it's like, I cannot tell you how important that is to me. And Councillor Armstrong, I, I agree. Like, I, I agree because I'm here and I'm like, you know, it, and it, I, because I actually work in um, policies and um, real estate myself. So I understand what I'm asking for is because we do set a precedent. And I agree. I, I, I hear you. Like I, I know, but yes, I, I, it's like now finished. And I'm like, okay, well, why, why couldn't you have told me this before? Like, I, I, I I'm sorry. Like, I, I, I wasn't involved enough because I'm like, next time there's a saying, yeah, measure twice and cut once, right? Like, so I'm like, I, but so yes, I will not be building anything on the front of the cottage. And I'm, I will happily go and talk to my neighbor and get, did Gary DeRose say that that was the name of the company, Naturalization Shoreline? What, what? Land. Land. We can get, sorry, yeah. Deputy Mayor, we yeah. can get that information yeah. to you, Linda. Oh. It is the land between, and they do have government funding to subsidize it. So there's a minimal amount required by the uh, property owner. Uh, so that at least there's some sharing of the cost, but it is all, it's heavily subsidized already. Okay, that's good to know. If I can add through you, Deputy Mayor Windover, yeah. um, as part of the submission for this application, there was a mitigation plan that was submitted in support, which talks about naturalization um, yeah. to mitigate the area between the water and the dwelling where it is located. And the municipality, we wanted to ensure that mitigation plan was correctly depicted so we had it peer reviewed by Stantec so we do have some detailed information on how this 
intervening area in the water yard could be improved to naturalize the area. So do we want to put that in the so, decision? Uh, through you, yes. I, I think we might have a way forward. I, in my yeah. mind, I think we do. For me, I would need some something. I would think that waiving your right for a three meter deck on the front of that yes. dwelling, and then having a consult with the land between, and you also need to implement all the mitigating mem measures that were in the plan, the mitigating mitigation plan. I think the three of those things can nearly justify the fact that it's eight feet closer to the water for me. If you're willing to do something like that, I think once we get to section 7.1, you'll find something different. Sorry, I was just making notes. Um, yes, as the homeowner, I'm as, I, I would be um, privileged to move ahead and I would do all of those three things. This seems like quite a complicated, and I'm looking at the at the picture here. It looks like the neighbor's the neighbor's buildings on your property too. <laughs> Wait, that right? Well, he is closer than he we'd like, but um, <laughs> but and, but he's uh, he, he's like become our best friend. He's like the fourth child we never had. So um, he he will have no issue um, with increase um, improving the shoreline because he he's talked about it with us. So we want just leave. I, I, I just have a yes. very quick question yeah. for you, Ron, to staff. Uh, are we allowed to recommend uh, a company or an, or an organization uh, in, in the form of a motion? Like, I don't know if I feel comfortable. Uh, I, I would feel more comfortable with saying the mitigation plan on the shoreline rather than say, a particular organization would have to be involved in it. Yes, so we're just directing people to a particular yeah. organization. I, I, I would hope she would go to that organization, but I don't feel it's our place to tell her that she must go to that organization. I, I would think you're right. Yes. Mm -hmm. Good point. Okay. okay. But she'll she'll have to bring something forward to us then. If she's going to do this in order for this, do we need to receive this or do we just move to the next one? We can yeah. move to the next file if the yeah. conversation's done and there'll mm -hmm. be a motion when we rise from the public meeting. Okay, thank you. Thanks now. So we continue then now. Okay, through you, Deputy Mayor Windover, we have our second public meeting and this is a public meeting for file number 21-18 to consider a zoning bylaw amendment submitted by agent Jessica Reed of EcoView Consulting Services for property owners Manny and Jasmine Martins and Zena Curry for a prop for a vacant property on Fire Route 298. The subject lands have a shoreline frontage of approximately 31.5 meters or 103 feet and a lot area of approximately 0.32 acres. The property is currently zoned shoreline residential private access. The applicant wishes to construct a new dwelling with an attached garage, which would result in a total ground floor area of 2,035 square feet and a gross floor area of 2,992 square feet. In addition, the applicant is also proposing an attached open air deck with a floor area of approximately 48 square meters or 516 square feet. In order to construct the proposed dwelling garage and deck, the applicant would require the following relief from the zoning bylaw. A reduction to the minimum water yard setback from 30 meters to 18.3 meters for the septic system. A reduction to the minimum front yard setback from 40 feet or 16.7 feet for the proposed dwelling and a reduction to the interior side yard setback from 15 feet to eight feet for the proposed dwelling. 
The 30 meter water yard setback is intended to be maintained. There is a planning report on the agenda from the municipality's planning consultant, Chris Jones. His report states that the application is generally consistent with provincial policy statement and the growth plan. The municipality has received a comment from the school board and Peterborough Public Health stating uh, that they had no objection to the proposed zoning bylaw amendment. In support of the application, an environmental impact study and archeological assessment were submitted. Further, if any members of the public did not register with the clerk indicating their intent to make an oral submission, but would like to do so at this time, please use the raise a hand feature so we are able to promote you in order for you to make an oral submission. And that concludes presentation. Thank you, Adele. Any questions? No. no. We'll put it in later. Um, we have Jessica Reed on the line who yeah. may have oh, wish okay. to oh, sorry. make a Oh, submission. yes. Sorry, Jessica. Good afternoon, Deputy Mayor Wendover and Councillors Armstrong, Friends, and Lamsett. My name is Jessica Ray Reed. I'm a junior planner from EcoView Consulting. I am just here to answer any questions that you may have, as I believe Adele covered everything that we're looking to do. We have reviewed Chris Jones's report and are totally okay with his findings, um, and we're good to move forward if there's any other questions. Hey, through you, Deputy Mayor, I just have a comment. I mean, this is this property does have some fairly unique topography on it resulting in the need to move this cottage to where it is. And I, I think there's good justification to have it where it is. So, thank you. Thank you, Darren, yeah. Okay, so just a side note later. We go on to the next one now then. Jesse, on to the next one now. Um, were there any other, I don't, did you ask for questions from council or? Yeah. Yep. Yeah, I did. Okay, thank you. Through you, Deputy Mayor Windover, our third public meeting is for file number 2020 to consider a zoning bylaw amendment submitted by agent Emma Drake, DM Wells Associated, on behalf of Buckhorn Community Centre for the property located at 1782 Lakehurst Road. The lands proposed to be rezoned were the subject of a severance approval with file numbers B2-20, 3-20, and 4-20. The severance approvals resulted in the creation of three new residential lots with road frontages of approximately 150 feet and lot areas ranging from one acre to 1.2 acres. The zoning bylaw amendment has been submitted to satisfy a condition of the consent approval to rezone the lots from Hamlet Commercial-2 to Hamlet Residential. The proposed use for all three lots is residential. The municipality has received comments from Peterborough Public Health stating they have no objection to the proposed zoning bylaw amendment. The municipality has also received a comment from a neighboring landowner who has expressed concern that the blasting or drilling that may be associated with the development of these three lots as such could have an impact on the water table as well as the existing embankment behind their home. The municipality's planning consultant, Chris Jones, has stated in his planning report that it is not anticipated that the development of these lots will require extensive site alteration, nor would it cause adverse impacts on the adjacent lands. Emma Drake is available on the line to answer any questions should council or the public have any. Further, if any members of the public did not register with the clerk indicating their intent to make an oral submission, but would like to at this time, please use the raise a hand feature so we are able to promote you in order for you to make an oral submission. And that concludes the presentation. Any comments? Thank you to you, Deputy Mayor. I have a, a question and it's just for my own and perhaps others edification. Can Adele or Emma, can you share with us what is the difference between a site plan and a reference plan? 
Uh, I can perhaps answer that uh, through you, Deputy Mayor. Um, a site plan documents um, where all of the buildings and structures are going to be on a property, uh, whereas a reference plan is um, your survey that would be prepared to show exactly where the boundaries of these lots are going to be. So the reference plan needs to be prepared so that the um, lots can be conveyed to new owners. Brilliant. Thank you. That was very clear and I appreciate mm -hmm. it. Any other comments? Uh, I mean, I was wondering, is is there going to be an entrance way off a maintained road onto these lots? Uh, yes, so through you, Deputy Mayor, um, the entrances to these properties would be from Lakehurst Road. Um, and I would advise that um, the, as Adele has noted, the consent applications have been approved um, by the county, um, which included comments on um, entrances and you know all of the criteria that are applicable to consent applications. So these rezonings are just to uh, fulfill a condition of those consent applications um, that are otherwise approved. Okay, so the county was okay. That's that's concerned about. Yes. Okay. Thank you. One little question. So is this document that's in front of us the reference plan or is this not accurate enough to be called uh, a reference plan? Yeah, through you, Deputy Mayor. Um, this is a what we'd call a consent sketch that has been prepared from our office um, based on the parcel fabric available from the county, um, but the reference plan would be uh, prepared by a legal surveyor. Thank you very much. Okay. Through, through you, Mayor Windover, it's Barb um, speaking, so I don't see my the raise the hand little icon. I just wanted to add that through the permit process, uh, because these lots are in proximity to some built up areas and some built up lots, uh, we would be asking for uh, some pretty detailed site plans on this. And I would be looking specifically for some drainage patterns. I don't want to see any water coming down on to the backs of those properties. Um, so it wouldn't be just your standard site plan of show me where the house is, the well is, the septic. There would be a lot more information I would be requesting here. Okay, okay. thank you very much. Yes, very good. Okay, so we just take things later. Yeah, okay, so in a motion to reconvene to a regular council meeting. Gary? Make motion. Carol will second it. I'll go in favor. Okay. So, no. Okay, I'm at seven now. So, minutes rising from the mean. Through you, Deputy Mayor Windover, um, as you are aware, further to our public meeting held this afternoon uh, regarding the proposed official plan and zoning bylaw amendments, the external planning consultant, Chris Jones, is not recommending that council approve the applications for the amendments. And he indicated in his report that um, such amendments would not have been supported back in 2018 and he is concerned that this would set a poor precedent um, would be established if, if, if we are to support something after the fact. In his opinion, the owner and their building contractor bear the responsibility of ensuring compliance with the regulation of the zoning bylaw. However, um, should Council choose to support the official plan and zoning bylaw amendments. Staff requests that the property owner enter into a site plan development agreement with the municipality to implement the recommendations of the mitigation plan and its peer review. And this agreement would be registered on title and staff would bring forward the official plan and zoning bylaw amendment to a future council meeting for council's approval. Comments to that? Yeah. I, I think I'm prepared to make a motion. Okay. 
I, I don't like to go against our planner's judgment, but it's unusual to have such a large error in the location of a building. I do believe that it was done in inadvertently. It wasn't on purpose, I don't think. So what my motion would read would be, I would like to approve the official plan amendment and the zoning bylaw amendment with the improved vegetative shoreline and implement all items of the mitigation plan and, and, and have the owner forfeit their right to have a three meter deck on the front of that cottage and also to have a detailed site plan development agreement with the municipality of Trent Lakes before any further development on the property. Okay. Yeah. All in favor? Could we have a recorded vote? Sorry. Please? Could we have a recorded vote? Recorded vote? Yeah, sure. Okay, yeah. Are we ready for the vote? I will take silent to say yes. Um, I will start with the person who requested the recorded vote, which is Councillor Armstrong. No, regretfully, but no. Councillor Franzen? Yes. Councillor Lambshead? Yes. Deputy Mayor Windover? Yes. Ms. Carey. And just may I make a comment? Next one, yeah. I, I think we better make sure in the future that this that is a requirement yeah. to have the location of the new building plotted and surveyed if it's in the 30 meter setback prior to constructing the new building. I, I think this was a requirement prior to this being done. It is not the municipality's responsibility that you locate your building in the right spot. It is yours and your contractors in the future. I think we make sure that's everyone knows that. Thanks, Terry. Through you, Deputy Mayor Windover, um, for our second public meeting for the Martins Curry. Um, further to the public meeting for file number 21-18, Chris Jones, the external planning consultant, notes in his report that during his site visit, some site alterations had already taken place on the property in absence of recommended mitigation measures proposed by the applicant's environmental consultant. At this time, the external planning consultant is recommending that the report be received and a site plan agreement be prepared for council's review and consideration, along with a zoning bylaw amendment to be brought forward at the same time at a later date. Thank you. Make a motion for this. Yes, I'll Carol. make the motion to uh, receive the report and to defer um, making a decision until we are in receipt of a site plan agreement. I'll Carrie. that with a little comment. I think we need to make sure that there's no more alterations to the site before the mitigating measures are put in there. So I think if we could include that in okay. Councillor Armstrong's motion, I would second that. I would accept that. Okay. Okay, all in favor? Approved, okay. Ms. Adele. Yes, and lastly, for the last public meeting we had, um, for file number 21-20, at this time, staff are recommending that council defer the approval of the proposed zoning bylaw amendment pending receipt of the registered reference plan for the three lots created by consent. Yes. Okay, make a motion for that, Jack Peter. I'll make a motion to support that. Yes. I will second uh, the motion to receive it and to defer it until we have a registered uh, reference plan. Okay, uh, favor? Mm -hmm. Okay, approved. So now we move on to delegations. And then Mr. Gary Kerr, are you ready to talk? <laughs> Gary? Good afternoon, uh, Deputy Mayor Windover, Councillor Armstrong, Franson, and Lambshead. Uh, thank you very much for your uh, time and the opportunity to do a delegation today. 
Um, the Cavendish Community Rate Payers Association, as you know, very involved in the community and uh, involved in a lot of initiatives. I'm the president of the association today. We wanted to talk to you about John Jack Edwin Clark, 1925 to 2020, who was in office when he passed away December 28th of 2020. Uh, Long-term resident of the Cavendish area uh, and really sets the bar as a model volunteer and community builder. Uh, just a couple of his accomplishments. He was also a, a volunteer OPP at the Cavendish Community Center, a volunteer fireman, uh, one of the original founders of the uh, Cavendish Community Ratepayers Association, uh, one of the group of men and women that got the funding and actually built the Cavendish Community Center, a uh, long-term member of Culture and Rec Library Board, and he has volunteered for a number of other initiatives and activities that many people would have seen, whether it's making coffee in the kitchen, turning on the dishwasher, or running the uh, garage sales they have for funding to the youth group over at the community center, he's always involved. Um, as a community, we have a need to recognize, preserve, and protect the history within our communities. And unfortunately, we are losing a lot of people like Jack Clark, and uh, and unfortunately, we risk losing a lot of that history. And so uh, as a separate item, we need to figure out how to preserve that. Uh, we have approached the uh, staff at the municipality. There is no official honorarium or naming policy, although there is one for you know uh, honoring trees, like dedicating a tree or a bench to people. Um, and we know that the uh, PRCAC is looking a little bit larger at, you know, kind of a heritage policy. In fact, I was looking at the uh, uh, information prior to this meeting and I read through their uh, presentation. In fact, they talked about a little today that they want to look at how to actually start to recognize not only uh, heritage sites, but buildings uh, and even people. Uh, but that's going to be future out. There is a celebration of life coming for Jack Clark uh, planned for September 18th. Uh, now that COVID has kind of, uh, uh, we're in stage three, and uh, Bev Clark, who's Jack's widow, is planning that. He's very well known in the community, as many of you know, uh, and very well known to staff and council. And as I mentioned before, was a director uh, of the CCRA when he passed away. Uh, so if you wanna to go to the last page then, thanks, Ann, or Jesse who's ever running the slides, and I appreciate your help. What we want to do is uh, honor the memory of Jack Clark in our community, in the Cavendish area specifically. And so the Cavendish Community Ratepayers Association, on behalf of the community, is requesting an extraordinary motion by council to approve for the installation display in perpetuity uh, a memorial plaque in the Cavendish Community Center. Um, initially, we thought in the Helen Bowen branch at the Cavendish Community Center, although we know there's a plan down the road that the community center will be rebuilt. Uh, but we'd like a memorial sign to be there in memory of Jack in, in perpetuity. And for the initial time being, which will be paid for by the Cavendish Community Ratepayers Association. So the only uh, implication to the, uh, community, the uh, municipality is physically who's going to mount the plate. But as you can see, there is a uh, image of the plate and we thought putting his uh, name and then the Jack Edwin Clark Memorial Reading Room. We know there isn't specifically a reading room. It merely is an area within the library and in memory of a model volunteer and community builder. Uh, we think it's important to uh, recognize people who have been such strong community builders and volunteers uh, we are actually looking at getting a uh, Government of Canada volunteer award, much like was presented to uh, John Jackson a few years ago. Unfortunately, uh, Jack passed away before that got completed. Um, so that is our request of council. And so what we're asking is, is not uh, anything we believe is unreasonable other than to recognize Jack and the Cavendish Community Centre in perpetuity. Thank you very much, Jim. 
comments? Yes, sir. I just like to make a comment. When we say Jack helped build the community center, he actually physically helped build some of the community center. It's not yeah. just you helped organize and get it done. It's that you actually have your hands on. And he will be sorely missed by that community. It was a long time, like decades of volunteers. <clears throat> I do, I do appreciate the fact that somehow we need to <coughs> recognize Jack. So thank you for this. I go oh, sorry. Um, I, I would like to make a motion with a comment. Can I do that, or do you want the motion to be seconded first, Jesse? Then I'll keep talking. Depends on the comment is <laughs> <laughs> until she cuts me off. Um, so first of all, a motion to receive the report. Second, I would like to support um, approval of the request. Uh, with two caveats. One, I think it is important that in future we have a policy like this because there are many deserving uh, volunteers in our community and there should be some consistency around how we treat them. And secondly, if it actually does go in the library that we, we probably should just run that by the, the library board, although I can't imagine they would have an issue with it. Um, so the motion is to receive the report, uh, support and approve the request um, but also ensure in future that we have a policy around that um, going forward and that the library board in future be consulted for things like this. Yes, thank you. I, I like to check on the motion with the comment. Uh, I, I, I really like the second part of the motion that we have to develop a policy because there are so many deserving members in our community that should be recognized and probably before they're done. Thank you very much. I just like to comment that I've certainly been involved with Jack a lot of years in my life, that's for sure. And he was, sir, was a great man. So uh, anyway, go ahead, Terry. Just one other little comment is that I, I think we will find that we need a policy through the municipality, but also through the Parks and Recreation Culture Advisory Committee Heritage Plan. That will be part of all of that. So I think that's, yes. it's, it's good sure. to develop it together. Good comment. Okay. So we have a vote on that then? All in favor? Absolutely. Very approved. Thank you. I'd like to I'd like to thank uh, Deputy Mayor Windover, Councilor Armstrong, Franson, and Lambshead for uh, supporting this. And uh, I know Beth Clark will be absolutely uh, just ecstatic to see it unveiled on September 18th. Thank you very much. Yeah, thanks, Jack. If I could thank you very much, comment. Gary. Yeah. It's delightful in these three different moods, delightful in these times to actually have something positive to celebrate. Yeah. And I think it's nice that we are in a position to be able to do that for somebody who contributed so much to our community. And uh, Gary, can you give us the information on uh, uh, when the, uh, the celebration of life will be? I know it's on the 18th, but I don't have time or place. Or, and I know Thank you're you. not the one organizing it, but. Yes, through Deputy Mayor. Um, so yes, these it is uh, scheduled for the 18th. Um, it's going to start at 1.30 to approximately 3 o'clock for family. And then it's going to be open to the community at about 3.15 to 3.30 until whenever. Uh, because of the restrictions, they're only allowed because of capacity 33 people in the building at any one time. And it will be in the community center. Um, I should point out too that we did go in advance to the library and uh, this sign is actually going to be in uh, brushed aluminum with a hardcore center, so it's very light. It's not a uh, heavy sign, and it's only 48 inches long by 16 inches uh, high and uh, could easily be attached to the uh, block walls or to the concrete ceiling if they felt it was better to hang it. But it's a like nine-foot ceiling. There's plenty of room. Okay, thank you very much, Karen. Okay. Very good. So, now 9 9.2. Delegation from Board Health regarding the consent program. Sir. Through you, Deputy Mayor Windover, it appears that um, Mr. Hay is having some technical difficulties connecting into the webinar. Um, so I don't see him online to be able to promote him. Um, he was delegating about a matter that is further on the agenda. 
a consent application. Mm -hmm. um, so um, if he's unable to connect, we may have to skip his delegation and proceed with the rest of the agenda. Okay, so we'll just put that aside right now for the staff reports. Yep. Okay. Oh, sorry, he's now on the line. Oh, is he? He is self muted, but he is available. Sure. See there, Corey? Oh, Gord. Uh, Gord, we can see you there. You are muted. So if you are on a desktop computer, you should see um, a red circle. Oh, you've got it now. Can you hear me now? I hear you now, yeah. Great. I'm just uh, I'm just here to answer any questions that the council might have. Any questions? Good. There. I, I don't know. If we have any questions at this time. We haven't got to that part of the agenda for your item. Yeah. Um, I know we've all most likely perused it and seen the issues and any concerns that they have. I don't. I think that comes at a later date. We were hoping that you had a little delegation just to explain your views on this application. Mm -hmm. uh, basically. Um, we're uh, we're looking to sever off one lot. Um, there is a an existing road. There's a bit of an issue with an existing road that goes to the back of the property. Um, but um, uh, the peer review and the environmental study both uh, agreed that we could use. Uh, the county planner agreed it was an existing road, so it, it's not part of a development. Um, but we wanted to build in a lot. That was back a, a little bit. A few. Uh, can you pull up the? Um, uh, just a moment. The the application. I think about page six. Um, you can see where it goes across the, the existing road goes across uh, the vegetation protection zone. It's just a short distance, and it opens up a whole bunch more developable, developable property in the back where we were hoping to build. We've already dug our test pits uh, for Ministry of Health, and everything else has gone through. So uh, basically, we we're looking at putting in a new driveway for the two properties. It'll come off the 507 uh, straight across the road from another driveway. And it'll be for the two properties. Um, it'll go down and we'll avoid any uh, uh, vegetation protection zone on that entrance, except for that short little piece that opens up the back property. I guess that's about all I have to say. Just Oh, sorry. Uh, thank okay, you, sorry. Uh, Gord, just a question. As I read through the file, um, the one thing yeah. that caught my attention was the concern by the county about the separation between the proposed driveways. And I, I maybe this is a question for later on to the planner or to you, but I couldn't tell whether that issue had been resolved in, in your plans. Um, it was just at the back at that one corner there. I've got to leave enough room to get a road in. I'm not sure if you can see my my pointer on that one, but it's at the at the back of the 400. Or the, the driveway will go in at the center of the uh, separation there. Page 17, kind of a trap. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, and I'll I'll save a, I'll ask the planner to elaborate on that as well later. Yeah, the application of consent is really where 
uh, I've got a good drawing of it. Uh, page six, I believe it is. Tools of Bragway. Yeah, I, I'm fine with it as long as it met yeah. whatever the concern was the the county raised. The, yeah, I don't think the county has an issue with it. No. It was the municipal planner that was concerned. Well, thanks for that. All right. Yeah. Thank, thank you, you very much for listening to. Me. Yeah. Get a motion. Mary. A motion to receive his comments. To receive, yeah. Second. Uh, Carol, thank you. All in favor? Okay, approved. Okay, now staff reports. Nothing in the public works, no. Recreation is still in none. And fire and emergency services. Good afternoon. Everybody hear me? Go ahead. Yeah. Yes. Through you, Deputy Mayor and Council, thank you. Um, before you, you have my report with the recommendation of uh, early wow. tendering processes to replace one of our vehicles that's already in our rolling stock plan. I'm just trying to get ahead of time commitments with COVID and such were four to six months to get a pickup truck today, apparently. So do you have any questions? I'd be happy to ask, answer any, sorry. Oh. Any questions, anyone? Oh, Carol. Yes. Thank you. I, I would make the recommendation to receive the report and to direct staff to proceed in tendering for that unit. Okay. Terry? Second by motion. Second by Terry, approved. All in favor? Pass. Okay. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Thank you. So, building and planning, Jeff. Thank you for you, Deputy Mayor Windover. The short term rental working group presented a report to Council in January which recommended a licensing program for short-term rentals. And at that time, a decision was deferred on the matter until September. In anticipation of this matter being brought back to council, the short-term rental working group reconvened on August 19th to revisit this issue and to thoroughly review the previous report, as well as the current situation of short-term rental regulations in Ontario municipalities. There were several modifications made to the application requirements from the original report. The proposed fee will be comprehensively reviewed and some items were, remo were removed from the supporting documents to be developed. The working group removed the recommendation to draft a licensing bylaw at this time. They do recommend a public consultation process be developed and public input be received and reviewed before a final recommendation will be made to Council. Should Council support a licensing approach at that time, the timeline will facilitate a draft bylaw to be presented in anticipation of a spring-summer 2022 implementation. The working group also recommends that they not be dissolved in order to assist with the development of the comprehensive public consultation process. And if council agrees with this recommendation, the working group would also request that council appoint an additional council member to serve on the working group. Any comments? Yes, Carol. Thank you. Um, for you Deputy Mayor. If I may, as a member of the working group, I just wanted to add a, a couple of comments to that. Um, First of all, it's it's unfortunate that the province has not addressed this issue, uh, like the province of Quebec, where they have imposed a licensing requirement across the entire province. Um, a municipality there may enforce or implement stricter measures, but they are at a minimum must have a licensing program. And the province, our province, seems to have no interest <laughs> or appetite for taking on this issue. Uh, the county of Peterborough has recently uh, just started to look into this, um, but from my perspective, it, it's going to be very difficult given that our eight municipalities are very divergent and uh, quite unique. So to have a countywide policy, I think is going to be very difficult, and I don't foresee that happening in the short term. 
So it's left to the 500 municipalities across Ontario to deal with it. Many have already, uh, and the solutions that are out there range from doing nothing uh, and leaving the existing bylaws that are in place right to the other end of the spectrum, which is banning short-term rentals completely. And I think most people would agree that neither one of those solutions would fit our particular problem. So to the best of the working group's ability, we have proposed a licensing program. It's fluid, it still needs input and um, modification and detailing. But I think the important thing at this point in time is to go forward with at least a proposal and so that we can then open up public consultation, uh, get the input in time so that we can use that to draft a program and, and bylaw proposal for the spring. So that's kind of my perspective having sat on, on the working group. Yes, Peter. I certainly agree with uh, a lot of the recommendations that uh, that that have been made. This is such an important issue for yes. municipalities, and uh, I wouldn't mind serving on that committee if, if uh, an extra member is needed. So we now make a motion to. Yep. He would make a motion that is recommended, really, I think is very close, right? That council receives a report from the Director of Corporate Services Clerk on behalf of the short-term rental working group regarding short-term rental licensing, additional considerations, and further that council direct the short-term rental working group to develop a public consultation process to receive input regarding the licensing program with an implementation date to be determined by council at a later date, and further that council appoint Councillor Franzen to serve on the working group. Okay, very good. I would second that. Okay, second. All in favor? Very good, approved. Yes. Okay. So, Adele. Thank you. Through you, Deputy Mayor Windover. This is a municipal appraisal form for consent file B38-19 and B39-19 submitted by agent William Lowcock on behalf of property owners Edmund and Constantino Duarte. The subject lands are located in part of lots 13 and 14, concession 9, Harvey. Application B38-19 conforms to the official plan as the proposed use is residential and the current land use designation is recreational dwelling area. A rezoning of the severed parcel will be required in order to address non-compliance with the current zoning bylaw. Staff have reviewed this application and recommend that Council support it subject that conditions of 1,000 cash in lieu of parkland fee be paid to the municipality a rezoning of the severed parcel to the satisfaction of the municipality, an agreement is entered into between the applicant and the municipality and is to be registered on title at the applicant's expense, which would address the recommendations of the environmental impact study dated March 2017 for the severed and retained lands and establish a building envelope site alteration area for the severed lot also that consent application B39 be refused or withdrawn and that the resultant new lot created by consent application B38-19 reflect the combined lot area of the lots originally proposed by B38-19 and B39-19. Application B39-19 would lead to the creation of a lot with a deficient building envelope and therefore constitute the creation of a lot that is not suitable for the purpose it was subdivided under section 5124D of the Planning Act. And that concludes the overview of this consent application. Okay, thank you very much. So we get a motion to... I make there. a motion to approve that yep. subject to all the conditions that were just reiterated by our plan. Okay. So second the motion. Oh, uh, Peter. Okay, thank you. All in favor? Okay. 
very much. Okay. All in favor. I just did that again. Through you, Deputy Mayor Windover. This is uh, two municipal appraisal forms for consent files B5021 and B5121 submitted by property owner Carrie Hendren. The subject land is located at 156 Nickel Cove Road and the application conforms to the official plan policies as the proposed use is residential and the current land use designation for all parcels is rural. Both the retained and the two severed parcels conform to the zoning bylaw provisions and a rezoning application is not required for either lot. Staff have reviewed the application and recommend that council supports it subject to the conditions of a thousand dollar cash in lieu parkland fees to be paid to the municipality and that concludes the overview of this appraisal form applications okay comments yes sir i'll make a motion make the motion board. okay with a thousand dollars in lieu of parkland okay yeah, so second carol thank you all in favor okay approved carry I get that now again. Yes, thank you, uh, Deputy Mayor Windover. Through you, there is a municipal appraisal form that's before you for consent file B-66-20, submitted by agent Emma Drake of DM Wills on behalf of property owner Sheila Cheshire. The subject land is located at 6 LaPlante Road. The application conforms to the official plan policies as proposed use is residential and the current land use designation for both parcels is Hamlet. Both the retained and severed parcels will become undersized lots and will be subject to a rezoning to address this area of non-compliance. Staff have reviewed the application, recommend that council supports it, subject to the condition of a thousand dollar cash in lieu of parkland fee to be paid to the municipality and a rezoning of the severed and retain parcel to the satisfaction of the municipality and an agreement would be entered into between the applicant and the municipality and registered on title at the applicant's expense which would address the recommendations of the environmental impact study dated february 10th 2020 and that concludes the summary of this maf form okay comments motion Terry, motion yes, to approve okay. it's a residential rezoning of the severed and retained lot thousand dollars with cash and loot and the enter into an agreement to address the environmental impact studies consent okay thank you very much okay now all in favor who second the motion i'll second yeah okay carol okay all in favor okay carrie mm -hmm. through you deputy mayor windover um, there is another appraisal form for consent B67-21 submitted by agent James Webster on behalf of property owner Julie Inwood. The subject land is located at 44 Bob Cajun Road. The application conforms to the official plan policies as the proposed use is residential and the current land use designation for all parcels is Hamlet. Both the severed and retained parcels will be subject to a rezoning to address non-compliance issues due to undersized lot areas. Staff have reviewed the application and recommend that council supports it subject to the condition of a rezoning for both the severed and retained parcel. A merger agreement be entered into between the transferor, transferee and the municipality and registered on title to merge the severed parcel with the abutting land and that the applicant provides a draft reference plan to the municipality illustrating the location of all building structures, driveways, parking areas, and similar existing structures of installation. The reference plan shall not be registered until the municipality has reviewed the plan and approved the location of all new lot lines. And that concludes the summary on this municipal appraisal form. Okay. Comments? Motion. Motion. Motion support okay. With all the conditions that are, were laid out by staff. Okay. Motion by 
Peter, second by. Second with a comment. Yeah. Um, two of these, I, I was struck by the fact that there was an EIS study done, a peer review, which questioned whether it was a complete EIS, a response which said, no, it wasn't a complete EIS, it was a scope one, and that was what it was supposed to be. And then the peer reviewer saying, okay. <laughs> so it just seemed to me like an awful lot of work um, and perhaps not clear definition the first time around as to what the actual scope of the EIS should be. And as a result, much consulting work and fees paid. So I just flagged that as something that I noticed as somebody who's not familiar with these processes, but it did seem that there was sort of a, a lack of specificity or clarity the first time around in terms of what the EIS should actually consider. Well, thank you. Rest my case. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so have a more forward on that. Through you, Through Mayor. Mayor. Deputy Mayor Wendover, I just would like to make a comment that I'll take that comment back to the county because this is a municipal or sorry, a county process and we're a commenting agency. So I will clearly identify your concerns with the application with the discrepancy between, you know, the scoped or a full EIS and then the peer review. So I'll be happy to take that back to the county as Thank comments. You. Through you, Deputy Mayor. Thank you very much, Bill. Yeah. I should I was negligent in pointing out that it was a, a county process, um, uh, not our own. So I appreciate you forwarding those comments to to that party. Thank you. Okay. Do we have a vote on that? Okay, approved. Good. Oh, there I think again, all right. <laughs> Through you, Deputy Mayor Windover, there are two municipal appraisal forms for consent B75-21 and B76-21 submitted by property owners Alan Pearson. The subject lands are located on County Road 121. The application conforms to the official plan policies as the proposed use is residential and the current land use designation for all parcels is rural. There is a resubmission. This actually, this application is a resubmission from 2019 as conditions were not met before the lapsing date. Both the severed and retained parcels were subject to a rezoning in 2020 under file number 20-33, which was approved by, um, by this council. Staff have received the application and reviewed it and recommend that council support the consents subject to the condition of a thousand dollar cash and move parkland fee to be paid to the municipality and that concludes the summary on this MAF. Okay, make a motion to carry. Yeah. Make a motion to approve. And Carol, I, I thought approve. this had become before us. Just Sorry. Okay. And I'll second that with the conditions as stated. All in favor? Great. Okay. Approved. I guess I dial again. Through you, uh, Deputy Mayor Windover. This is another municipal appraisal form for consent file B75-20 submitted by Gary Bell on behalf of property owner Jeff Cheshire. The subject land is located at 1694 Lakehurst Road. The application conforms to the official plan policies as the proposed use is residential and the current land use designation for both parcels is Hamlet. The retained parcel will comply with the zoning bylaw, but the severed parcel will be subject to a rezoning. The recommended rezoning of the severed parcel would be to Hamlet residential and environmental protection. Staff have reviewed the application, recommend that council support it, subject to the condition of a $1,000 cash and little parkland fee to be paid to the municipality, a rezoning of the severed parcel to the satisfaction of the municipality and an agreement which would be entered into between the applicant and the municipality and registered on title at the applicant's expense and would address the recommendations of the environmental impact study dated August 21st, 2020. And that concludes the summary on this MAF. Make a motion. Carol, yes. Motion to support with the conditions. Yeah. Second. 
carry. All in favor? Carry. Okay. Not done yet, Adele, I think, are we? <laughs> Through you, Deputy Mayor, this is the last MAF, oh, and yeah. I, we have Allison to thank for processing all these municipal appraisal forms, so we get them over to the county and lessens our, our workload here. On today's agenda, there is the municipal appraisal form for consent file B86-20, and it was submitted by property owners Gord and Caroline Hay. The subject land is located at 4107 County Road 507. The application conforms to the official plan policies and the proposed land use is residential and the current land use designation for both parcels is rural. Both the severed and retained parcels do not conform to the zoning bylaw and will be subject to a rezoning. The recommended zoning of both the severed and retained parcels is rural and environmental protection. Initially, this was an application for the creation of two lots. However, application B-87-20 was withdrawn by the applicant and application B-86-20 was amended to enlarge the new lot in order to meet entrance requirements as per the County Roads Department. Staff have reviewed the application and recommend that Council support it, subject to the condition of a $1,000 cash in lieu of parkland fee to be paid to the municipality, a rezoning of the retained and severed parcel to the satisfaction of the municipality, an agreement which would be entered into between the applicant and the municipality and registered on title at the applicant's expense, which would address the recommendations of the environmental impact study dated September 2020, formalize a building envelope on the vacant land and include provisions related to a shared or mutual driveway and a surveyed plan identifying the location of the existing traveled driveway or road located on the severed and retained lands, as well as the building envelope for the vacant lot. And that concludes the summary. Okay. Make a motion, motion to approve that okay, with the conditions Mary, just specified. Peter. Okay. All in favor? Very good. Okay. Carried. Now, get off Adele and Donna, please. Right, through you. And then. Um, just accounts payable July and August for your information. I'm happy to answer any questions if you have any. Prove it. Yes, Carol. Yep. I'll make a motion to approve motion the. Approve. Uh, Report. Receive, yeah. Peter, okay, thank you. And, okay, all in favor? Carried, okay, good. Administration, none. Okay, corporate service. And, receive me around. For you, Deputy Mayor Windover to cancel. Tender T-05-2021 for the supply and delivery of one mobile water apparatus tanker was posted on June 23rd and closed on August the 11th. Two bids were received and reviewed for compliance. This procurement was approved as part of the early tendering of rolling stock in accordance with the municipality's asset management plan and funding for the project was included in the 2021 approved budget in the amount of $415,000 with the remainder of the funds in the amount of $106,772.37 to be included in the 2022 budget. Staff are recommending award of the tender to the lowest compliant bidder being Fort Gary Fire Trucks Limited. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, motion to approve this. Comments? Okay, I'll Terry. Make a motion to receive the report. Receive it. Deputy Clerk approving tender number T05 2021 for the supply and delivery of one mobile water apparatus to Fort Gary Fire Trucks Limited and to include 106,000 and change in the 2022 budget. Okay, seconder, Peter, thank you. With a comment, they yes. are expensive. <laughs> <laughs> really? Yeah. Okay. All in favor? 
Very good. Carrie. I get uh, you again. Thank you. Through you, Deputy Mayor Wendover to Council, this report brings forward Council expenses submitted for the month of July for Council's consideration and approval. Thank you. Okay. Receive it. Motion. Yes, Peter. Motion. To approve. Approve. Yeah. Okay. Second, Terry. That was a comment about mine not being there again this month. Oh, no. It would be with that my, there. I'm what? still having issues with my technology. I will get it in. Sure. <laughs> That's enough of that. Eh? <laughs> All in favor? Okay. Motion carried. Now, okay, correspondence. Does anyone want to have a break rang for a little while? Yeah, for five minutes. Yeah. Okay. We'll have a break then. Okay.
So, correspondence to information now. A motion to receive. Okay, okay, we'll be received. Carol, uh, okay. No, well, uh, all in favor? Yeah. Okay, approved. So, 11. Correspondence for action. Gravel Watch Ontario. It's, uh, sorry. Through you, Deputy Mayor Wendover, perhaps to um, help council out, if there were any that they wanted to pull, um, you could identify those. If not, one motion to okay. receive all of them would be sufficient. Any more? If there were any council wanted to support, yeah. you could pull them out. But if not, one motion to receive them all. Okay, good. I can do that. So I'll move to receive all of the correspondence for information. Okay. And second by Peter. Okay. All in favor? Carry. Okay. Good. Okay. So now we have the bylaws. Sorry, Deputy. Uh, yes, by all. Deputy Mayor, did we do the correspondence for action? I, yeah. I, my motion was we for those for that. information. Yeah. No, I don't think we are. No, we had already done that. Concerned about. <laughs> we already made a motion before that. No, my I'm, my motion was for correspondence for information. Through um, Councillor Franzen moved to, to receive all the correspondence for information, and Councillor Armstrong seconded it, and that was carried. And then I had suggested that if there were none yeah. that Council wanted to support, they could receive it all the correspondence for action. Yeah, so one that's motion, right. Oh, which I'm was sorry. moved by. Now, yeah. But I didn't say them. I did say correspondence for information. Okay, so would you like to go back to each correspondence? No, item? I would make a motion to, <laughs> okay. to receive all. All the correspondence. <laughs> That's what I had. Yeah, yeah. yeah I didn't oh, say that. No, oh, but but she did. I, got, uh, I don't know. She did. Just didn't say it. Eh? Yeah. <laughs> Soon heard in a second. <laughs> so we got that all straightened out now. Yeah, I think so. It's okay. So now we're in bylaws, are we? Yeah. Okay. So through you, Deputy Mayor Wendover, there were several bylaws on today's agenda that didn't have a public meeting or a corresponding report to Council. The first is B-2021-98, which is a zoning bylaw amendment for file 2113, which had a public meeting on August 10th, and the application was supported by Council and staff were directed to pair a bylaw to be brought forward for adoption. B-2021-99 is a bylaw to stop up, close, and sell parts of the original Shore Road Allowance uh, for a property in series 32. B2021-100 is a bylaw to authorize the acquisition of land for the purpose of a public highway. B2021-101 is the bylaw to appoint Gerald Moore, Gerald Moore of RSM Building Consultants as Deputy Chief Building Official. And B2021-103 is a bylaw to authorize the execution of a cost recovery agreement with Dooney Mountain Farms. Okay. Now, I'll approve that, yeah. I will make a motion to approve zoning bylaw amendment B 2021-098 for Bergeron. Okay, second that. Carol, okay, thank you. So all in favor? Okay, carried. Another motion. Make a motion to stop up and close and sell series 32. Okay. Sachner. Carol, okay, thank you. All in favor? Carried. Go next. Okay. And then more, 40. Yes. I will make a motion to for the road acquisition bylaw for Kimball to approve. Okay. Second by Peter. All in favor? Carried. Okay. 
13-1-5. Motion for that. Oh, Peter, sorry. Yeah, uh, appoint the Deputy uh, Chief Building Official, uh, RSM Building Consultant, Gerald Moore. Okay, good. Second there. Second, yeah, just a question. Could we have some um, explanation around this? I, I know we're required statutorily to appoint a Chief Building Officer. Um, just a little bit of the sort of rationale behind Sure, I can do that through you, Mayor, uh, Deputy Mayor Windover. So uh, RSM has been appointed as a chief building official. Uh, now that I've, I've uh, joined the team, I am now the chief building official. It is important for us to have a deputy chief building official because in the absence of the CBO, uh, we still need to get permits issued and uh, do certain work that requires a CBO to do through the Building Code Act. Um, my plan is to, and I've talked to my staff about this, is to uh, provide the education towards Matt to, to be working towards this goal. Uh, to to maybe fill that seat one day, but in the meantime, we do need to have somebody in that role. So that's the idea of the the bylaw. Thank you very much. Appreciate Great. that, Barb. Okay, and that was Terry. Yes, right. Yes, Terry, do you want? I think there was a motion and a second, or well, we just need a vote. Yeah. Can you make a motion? I second it. Yeah. Hmm. All in favor. Very okay. Cost recovery. Any motion for that? Sorry. Mm -hmm. Third. Okay, you make that motion, Jerry? I make a motion, but I just need a little explanation for sure. If we could get a small, small amount of explanation as to what this is. Motion. Through you, Deputy Mayor Windover, um, the cost recovery is to offset any costs when we have peer reviews done of various studies that were submitted on the application. So we don't have to go back to the applicant and say, okay, now we need another $5,000 for a peer review of say a noise study. We have the money in hand and we can work quicker by getting the money to the consultant after they've done their peer review of the various studies. So we hold some monies and that's what it's used for. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. My so motion stands to approve. Pardon? My motion to approve stands. Okay, okay. Second by I would second it, but I, I have a a potential amendment to it. There's a clause on page two, which I'm searching to find. Um oops, sorry. And Anne and Donna, you'll know just what I'm talking mm -hmm. about. Uh, We're both here. Uh, number three, the municipality hereby notice, notifies the applicant that it intends to retain the municipality's solicitor to provide legal services relating to the review, preparation, and execution of documents in connection with the applicant's application. I would like that broadened so that we can use other uh, legal counsel for review of the documents. Uh, and not just municipal's counselor, uh, Mr. Ewart. And so I'd like to amend the wording that says the municipality hereby notifies the applicant that it intends to retain the services of uh, its municipal solicitor and others as, and others, yeah. just add and others to that, so that we have the latitude to use other solicitors besides Mr. Ewart in the review of the documents. Would that be acceptable to the mover? I, I'm acceptable with that as long as staff is. Okay. So you second that, so all in favor. Just oh, sorry. Comment, just a comment that I think that's very, very important because there has been discussion around that. Yeah. 
Okay, go ahead, Sharon. Yeah, through, through you. So if I may just suggest the following wording, and that would be that bylaw B2021-103 being a bylaw to authorize the execution of a cost recovery agreement between Dooney Mountain Farms and the Corporation of the Municipality of Trent Lakes be read a first and second time. And further, that Section 3 of Schedule A to Bylaw B2021-103 be amended as follows, that the municipality hereby notifies the applicant that it tends to retain the municipality's solicitor or others, and others? And or. And or others. Um, to provide legal services relating to the review, preparation, execution of documents in connection with the applicant's application, and further that the bylaw being B2021-103 uh, be read a third time and pass this seventh day of September 2021. Took the words right out of my mouth. <laughs> I knew it. <laughs> <laughs> <That was> really? <laughs> okay. I think I made that. Okay. All in favor of that? Yes. All in favor? Yeah. Okay. Carried. Good. So, we get business arising out of other meeting, previous meeting. Any? Okay. Knows a motion. Then, so we can have this with the mayor not here, right? I think through oh, you, Deputy yeah. Mayor. I think the mayor asked me, and she certainly okay, did ask me to read this motion for her. So I'm going to go ahead and do so. Yeah. With your Okay. Whereas routine eye care is critical in early detection of eye diseases like glaucoma, cataracts, and muscular degeneration, and the health of eyes is critical to overall health and quality of life, and whereas conditions that may be detected by an annual eye exam include diabetes mellitus, okay, I'm not sure on the wording, glaucoma, cataracts, retinal disease, embolophobia, lazy eye, visual field defects, loss of part of the visual field of vision, Corneal disease, stabismus, cross eyes, recruitment, hepatitis, and inflammation of the evia, and layer of the eye that consists of the iris, ciliary body, and forehead. Optic pathway disease, whereas payments of from OHIP have will only have only increased nine percent over the past thirty years, which is not come close to matching the inflation of costs which include rent staff utilities equipment taxes and supplies and whereas the lack of funding makes it difficult to invest in modern technology and newer technology means earlier detection of eye disease and whereas the provincial government's refusal to formally negotiate with optometrists for more than 30 years has forced the optometrists to absorb approximately 173 million dollars annually in the cost to deliver eye care to ontario Whereas the 2021 Ontario budget did not address OHIP insured eye care, OHIP, Ontario Autometrists took action and voted to withdraw OHIP services starting September 1st, 2021, unless the government agrees to legally binding negotiations to fund these services, at least to the cost of delivery. And whereas the job action will jeopardize good eye care for those who need care of an optometrist and most and the most and will have the greatest impact in the most vulnerable groups, children whose lifetime ability to learn and develop depends on good to five good vision, and the elderly who are the greatest risk for vision treatment ocular diseases. Now therefore, very resolved that the municipality of Trent Lakes requires that the provincial government recognize the value that accessing to access, access to quality eye care brings to all Ontarios an act now to protect it and further that the provincial government address OHIP insured eye care immediately and enter into legally binding negotiations with Ontario optometrists to fund these services, at least to the cost of delivery prior to any job action taking place and further that a copy of this resolution be forwarded to Premier Ford of Ontario, Ministry of Health, Christine Elliott, MPP David Smith, MPP David Tassini, MPP Laurie Scott and the Ontario Association of Autometrists and to all municipalities in Ontario. I care, Ontario OHIP insurance. It's a very, very long motion. <laughs> so, I'll, I'll second the motion. Okay. Go Question, and I know it's not, it's, thank you, Deputy. Yeah, sure. Um, I know it's not your motion, Terry, but I'm just curious where this came from. <laughs> 
why we're raising it and do we know that it's factually correct? Through, through you, Deputy Mayor. Yeah. I, I believe it's factually correct because of some things that we've heard on on television and radio and things that the optometrists have definitely withdrawn from the OHIP services as of September 1st. So, and, and it's for these reasons that they are $173 million annually in deficit of payments from OHIP. So I, I think the facts may be slightly, I'm not positive on the exact numbers, but I do believe that this is factually correct. And the reason we're raising it? Just to try to get the provincial government to enter into negotiations with the optometrists of Ontario to yeah. try to help fund it. Thank you. Okay. If my memory is correct, I believe that we have dealt with this in motion that we've received from other municipalities in correspondence or something very similar. Yes, yeah, something similar. Yeah. Well, all in favor of this one? Have you, yeah. Are you calling for a vote? Pardon? Are Probably you, vote, yeah. Did we deal, oh, sorry, sorry, did we deal with yeah. Councillor Francis's uh, question first? Oh, well, uh, is that a question or just a comment? It, it, it's a comment. And yeah. And the question, uh, have, have we not received correspondence from other municipalities dealing with this issue or a very similar issue? To my knowledge, no, but... Um, my memory could not be serving me correctly. Yeah. Yeah. So I think I think this is coming to the county also. It's a very similar situation that their province is no longer going to be funding the optometrist. So the optometrists uh, have been charging fees above all yeah, mm -hmm. for certain procedures. Yes. So do we vote on this? Okay, so it's approved. Okay, now, so are you fine here? So I'll have to sit down. We'll just need to call for the vote. For that. Oh, call, I thought, okay, call the vote. Yeah. Okay, we'll just... I'll have to step aside and let Peter would come. <laughs> Okay. Oh, you, you don't have to physically. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But Deputy Mayor Warren Windover has removed himself from the chair. Okay. Okay. I'm just not going to remove myself out of the chair. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Metaphorically. Okay. Uh, whereas the gypsy moth is confirmed in spaces species, which feeds on a variety of hardwood species such as oak, birch, maple, and softwood species such as pine and spruce. And whereas many areas within the province, and specifically in the Trent Lakes, have seen a significant increase in the infection of the gypsy moth. And whereas the province sprayed for the gypsy moth in 1980 and was successfully in minimizing the outbreak. Now, therefore, be it resolved that council requests that the province reintroduce a spraying program to help combat the infection of the gypsy moth. Thank you, gypsy moth. Seconded, please. I think I need more information. I guess I'd have a comment, if I may. Uh, sure. oh, no, no. You need a second or first. Yeah. Uh, since the resident is that either of the motion has failed. Okay. Okay. Here, Mary. No. Okay, I'll take it back to seat over again, I guess. Councilor Francis? Yeah. Do you have one? Yes, uh, acknowledgement? my uh, notice of motion, uh, land acknowledgement. 
whereas the municipality of Trent Lakes has great respect for indigenous cultures or people, cultures, and communities. The municipality of Trent Lakes recognizes the traditional territories of the indigenous people. Be it resolved that the Council of Municipalities of Trent Lakes implement Curve Lakes approved land acknowledgement statement to recognize the traditional territory of the First Nation peoples during our open ceremonies of regular council meetings. I'll, I'll move that motion. A very supportive second. Okay, all in favor? Okay. Okay, and again, Peter. Um, this is the vaccine policy. Uh, COVID-19 is a worldwide uh, pandemic, where several or several effective vaccines have been developed, and whereas vaccinations are a means to reduce virus transmission and protect the health of staff and rate payers. Now, therefore, we resolve that council direct staff to develop a policy on vaccination and testing in regards to COVID-19. I'll make that motion. I would second it and perhaps propose a friendly amendment. Which, yeah, sure. Um, which is that uh, council direct staff in consultation with SHRP and legal counsel yeah. to develop. Yeah. Great, thank you. Yeah, okay. and that, that, that would not it's be- It's probably intrinsic, well. but yeah. Yeah. And just like a There's comment too, I think we are developing the policy right now anyway. I think I've seen some, maybe we're in the process of doing that anyway. So this is a, another step to formalize that. I would hope that everybody that works for the municipality would have the vaccine. vaccine. But uh, I don't want to see anybody leave our employment because of that. So I, I would hope that uh, in our policy, we would have uh, uh, twice week testing, the rapid test, which is free at the time being. But if there's some cost, I think the staff that uh, refuse the vaccination should bear the cost of the yes. testing. Those are just comments. That's not in the motion, right? No, no that's yeah. fine. Thank you. Okay, so you did you I second, second it. it, right? Okay, so all in favor? Okay, approved. Okay, then. So I guess now information items. So that's on report for external board or committee. I could make one little yeah. report there that finally the Cavendish Community Cavendish Community Committee there we're, we're actually going to have a meeting on October 20th so we're back to having meetings Yay. we've been a little bit nervous of having meetings due to all the COVID situations and things so hopefully we're having a very safe and good meeting Okay. That's great. Mm -hmm. So we went to a closed session then. Close me. I'm oh, sorry, yeah. No, I was gonna say a motion to go into closed. Yeah, okay. I'll second that motion. Okay. Okay. I'm sorry. All right. Oh, sorry. Sorry, you may remember. Just before we go into closed, I would just like to state that we are going into close to discuss. Um, under section sure, yeah. uh, 239.2b and d to discuss personal matters about an identifiable individual, including municipal or local board employees and labor relations or employee negotiations.
Raj. Uh, Peter. Terry. All in favor? Carry. Okay. Business rising out of closed session. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's just the minutes from the regular closed meeting dated August 10th and the special closed meeting August 13th. Adopt the minutes. Okay, Carol, Peter, I mean, Terry, sorry. Okay, all in favor? Carrie. Okay, Terry, Terry. Okay, all in favor? Carry. Adoption is confirming by law. Peter, Terry, all in favor? Carried. Now, go. Adjourn. Adjourn. Motion to adjourn. Yeah. Okay. And there. Okay. Good. We're done. Are you all in favor? Good.